Now you're welcome back. We are continuing our History of Sports series. We have Professor Paul Rouse with us from UCD School of History. And Paul, we are talking this week. Last week it was about the growth of women and their participation in sport. This week it's about sport and war. Sport and war, Joe, and, and sport and nationalism, sport and imperialism, and the manner in which politics and sport are intimately wrapped into each other. And this notion trotted out by people repeatedly through the decades that sport and or that sport and politics are should be separated or must be separated and are separated and the repeated proof that the complete opposite is the case so in advance of this chat i knew it was going to be sport and war that was the heading and you sent on your notes i must confess i thought this would be very much a sport during world war one sport during world war two chat it's not that. So sport and war, where do you want to start? What's the jumping off point and what are we hoping to get across over the next 40 minutes or so? It, it is sport. It is sport in World War I, but it is, it is also uh, more than that. It has to be an understanding that, that poli the politics of division are created long before war starts and it, it's used in, in all of this. And you can see it in the rhetoric of, of sports organisations. Now, it's sometimes said that it was the GEA that brought politics into it. Irish sport and through its ban rules and we can talk about the ban rules and how they operated and, and what they meant but it, it's, it is a, a simple thing that it was the British Empire which soaked the sports of this country in the symbolism of British imperialism in the symbolism of this idea that the, the English uh, the domination of the parliament in London was something that was real and it was made real on playing fields. So, for example, when there was a tennis competition played in Dublin and the Lord Lieutenant attended, there would be a military band from the British Army playing regimental songs uh, of that army. The Union Jack would be flying on the breeze uh, in, in on warm summer days as the Lord Lieutenant came in with the anthem then being played, God Save the Queen, and so on. So this is the patronage of the English, of the sporting organisations was always identified, say, for example, for rugby, um, was identified with the Lord Lieutenant and with the government. And the opening, the very first min minutes of the Rugby Football Union in, in the middle of the 1870s talked about how the purpose of founding an international team was to bind together international companies and, and to actually, in a spirit of fellowship. Now, as we all know, that's not exactly how international sport turned out at all. But you can see sporting tours the, the origins of sporting tours were about binding the empire together. So the New Zealand Maoris came in the 1880s. The New Zealand All Blacks came in 1905, a famous tour led by Dave Gallagher, Donegal. And in, in return, uh, the British, the Britain and Ireland team, later the British and Irish Lions, and now I suppose, really just the Lions, they began touring the other way. Mm. Uh, and, and, this, and they go to South Africa in 1896, and there's seven or nine Irish Irish. Uh, players on it and the idea is that this is a kind of um a culture of empire where there are also race tracks all across the british empire and the size of this empire is say again a quarter of the expanse of the world one-fifth of its people within the british empire and ireland is part of that and it, it part of so so the idea though that sport would be used to bind that empire together also came asunder by the very fact of people using beating that empire, beating England as a rite of passage. So it was a massive thing for West Indies cricket to, to beat the English. It was a massive thing for South African and, and New Zealand rugby players to come to England and beat them. And of course, we know what beating England still means for Irish people. Yes. So this is, this is, this is a rite of passage, which was an expression of independence. And if you're somewhere like Scotland or Wales, where the language is largely peripheral, and you've been, you're within, you're within um, a Britain where you are not an equal with England in any meaningful sense of the word in terms of population and economic power. Sport became um, an, a, an opportunity to express a sense of, of pride in your capacity to beat England. In terms of Scotland, it was usually soccer and for Wales, it was rugby. Yes, it was rebellion played out without the bloodshed. Absolutely, and, and uh, it, it became something huge and almost, it's this idea, I suppose, of sport as the opium of the masses taking over from, 
religion. There's these, um, there's a school of, uh, um, you have to bear with me a little bit here, but there's a school of French Marxist sociologists and political scientists from the, 18, from the 1970s who wanted sport banned because they thought sport was basically stopping revolution, stopping global revolution. So, for example, they called for the 78 World Cup in, in Argentina to, uh, to, to, be, to be banned. They wanted the Olympics banned. They, they said it was the opium of the masses and that it was sporting organizations and the amount of time that people spent talking about sporting teams, which was deflecting them from the real work of fermenting revolution in, in France in the 1970s and by extension all around the the world and there's this um there's this brilliant sociologist who wrote a book uh jean-marie prom uh, jean-marie brome called sport a prism of measure of time and this was basically uh, uh, a kind of he set out these theses as to why um people fell against the world and in order to do that their first step was to get rid of sport right what was marx talking about when he coined the phrase opium of the masses what he was talking about religion and he was talking about the nature in which people it's this idea that you will be rewarded in another life rather than trying to fix the life you have around you. And, okay. and it's this idea that, that, you, uh, that, that people find ways to, it's almost like it's handed down. There are ways found to distract you from the awfulness of your life, um, so-called, mm. um, in order that you don't actually take on the forces that are clearly oppressing you. Okay. Well, there is a real argument then that sport is the modern day opium. Um, it denies agency to people, though, because it means that you have a choice and that there are loads of people who don't have any interest in sport, who have no interest either in revolution. So it doesn't, it doesn't really, um, hold. It, doesn't really the, it doesn't really the, hold. As the great distraction from whatever, not necessarily your oppressive masters, but just as the great distraction. Is it not the primary bit of opium that we all have around the world? I think it's really interesting. People have always found ways. And I think the one thing that I've tried to show over, over the last few weeks is the extent to which people have always found ways to enjoy themselves. And people have always found ways to embed rec ways of recreation into their lives. And you can see it at the moment um, with organized sport, maybe uh, not being played at the moment, but there is huge levels of recreation. I would say unprecedented in modern Irish history levels of recreation and reports from the Sport Ireland will show that, I think, over the coming months in terms of their participation um, surveys. So people always find ways to, to, to do this. And I think there's a false binary between um, playing sport and rebelling, as if, you know, they're, they're the two choices that are, that are, that are open to you. Um, and, and, like, the reality of it is that people, people love love the idea of play and there's a really interesting and maybe we should talk about this next week or the week after but we, we there's a really interesting thing i think happening in the world of sport at the moment where we can look at the extent to which people are going to return to organized sport when it comes back this this gap of what could be three months six months nine months who knows how what, what will that do to participation levels you're suspecting it might take a hit i think it's going to be really interesting to watch uh, certainly the treadmill of of uh, people who are shuffling, for example, their kids from event to event and from training to training. I think they're having a long, hard look at things in the nature of uh, how society is, is gone at the moment. But that's the way it has, it has always worked. And it's a reminder, again, that sport is embedded in society and within societal change. Okay, so this is all very interesting. So sport is being used by the empire to bind it together, to solidify it, to give it, it some kind of uh, cultural commonality. In Ireland, around rugby matches or cricket matches, the Union Jack is flying. We have dignitaries there. It is very much of the empire. And then particularly interesting in Ireland, you have at the forefront of some kind of cultural war, the GAA. Like, I'm not sure if that was there in other countries necessarily in the form of a big sports organization. And they're trying to impose bans on its members and they're trying to fight the fight. And then equally, even within that, just to add a bit of complexity, lots of its own members think, oh, but I quite like soccer and I quite like going to the dance and so on. Yeah. Break the rules. So that is the very interesting melting pot open to, so that brings us what, to about 1910s? It gets you to the eve of war. Okay. And there's one thing about being able to, to call someone a Shawnee for playing cricket. And it's another thing for you to say, oh, they're only playing bog ball. It is a rhetoric in both ways. And it's cultural rhetoric and it's culture wars but there's a massive difference between culture war and war. And what you saw in Ireland after 1912 
was the pulling apart of the threads, both locally and then internationally, in which Ireland was involved in a global war, which left no space anymore for that kind of ambiguity. People were now forced to choose. So you, you see, for example, what happened after 1912. So 1912, the British government promised to introduce home rule for Ireland. It's put in the statute books. Ulster, as many people will know, are sections of Ulster utterly reject the idea of home rule. They want to be, they want the parliament in London. They see themselves as utterly given to the empire and to the United Kingdom. So they found the Ulster Volunteer Force in, in response to this and they run in arms and they pledge to resist the idea of home rule in armed rebellion. In response to this nationalist in the South formed the Irish Volunteer Force and they, they, they form this force and they say from 1913 that they are going to defend the idea of home rule. So you get an increasing fraying in Ireland of a society where it's loyalist v nationalist, a unionist v nationalist, mm. and it's so bad, it is so bad that it is to the point of cliche. Um, essentially, it's almost well the outbreak of war in in Europe in the summer of of 1914 is almost welcomed as a reprieve from what's clearly an impending, what appears to be an impending civil war in Ireland. Okay, what about through the World War One years then? Oh, this is, this is where it gets, the, the minute the war breaks out, there's a meeting in the smoking room of the old castle restaurant in, in, in Belfast, where uh, meeting members in that city of rugby, hockey, soccer, cricket, boat clubs, bowling clubs, rifle clubs, yachting clubs, they come together and they pledge to set up a battalion of people to, 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 to fight for the British Army in the war. The northern branch, basically Ulster Rugby, uh, decided to s- suspend all matches and they were followed in this by the Irish Rugby Football Union. All rugby matches stop in, in 1914 and it, because as the circular said, it is felt that at the crisis of the empire, the formation of a battalion of people to fight would appeal strongly to the patriotism and sporting instincts of the young men. Um, and down, th- that's what happened in Belfast. And in Dublin, F.H. Browning, the president of the Irish Rugby joined a call. He called on all the players and members, officials of Dublin rugby clubs to do their bit and to join the war effort. So they formed the Irish Rugby Football Union, formed a volunteer corps and more than 100 members of that volunteer corps enlisted in the Dublin Fusiliers and went to fight um, for the British Army in, in Europe. And you see, for example, 35 members of Clontarf Rugby Club alone had joined the army. Um, and so there were about 300 in all rugby players who joined the, the volunteer corps initially straight away. This is just straight away. This is not over a period of time. Um, and um, many of them, well, fought and died in Gallipoli, for example. And nine, nine Irish rugby internationals lost their lives um, during this period. And if you look even at club teams like UCC, UCC won the Munster Senior Cup in 1912 and 1913. And nine of the 22 players who played on those teams served in, in the war. And this was, thought was a story repeated all around the place. And it was only in 1919, 1920 that the rugby season was restored. So five years essentially without rugby. So I certainly get that the authorities are very much aligned with what we might traditionally think, you know, rugby, cricket, all of these sports want to help with the war effort and we'll probably get on to GA now. What about on the ground, like some of those people, the volunteers, the players, like does it necessarily follow that in the main, I'm sure there were exceptions, but in the main, are we talking about an Anglo-Irish cohort who played rugby and then went to the war? Or were there just a bunch of lads as Irish as it gets who quite like rugby and then fell in with the rugby lads and went off to war as well? Um, it's a mixture of everything. So you do, you get people who absolutely identify with empire who try and go. But the sheer swathe of people, this is one of those things that's conveniently, or was for many years conveniently forgotten from Irish history, the extent to which the, the recruitment to the British Army was broad-based during these years, despite any rhetoric against enlistment. It is a simple fact that all across the society, there was huge enlistment. Those in this, that enlistment came from for different reasons. There were people who identified with empire. Yeah. There were people who responded to the call from the Irish Nationalist Party that they should join the British Army in order to protect home rule, many of whom were GA people as well. Mm. And then you have people who went out of sheer economic need, they joined the army. And others who went undoubtedly for a, a, a sense of adventure. And then furthermore, others who probably felt guilty 
and had to go and so on. Mm. Uh, ascribing motivations is a really difficult thing in thing. history and ascribing in, mot- in, in, in my Leaving Cert history, the, 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 the strong memory I have is this was very much taught to me as this was the home rule effort. Yeah, and it doesn't that it, it it doesn't wash. It it doesn't wash just as that. It's it's more than that. And you can see this as well. The impact on 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 sport was was kind of really interesting depending on the sport. So soccer didn't stop during the war. Soccer kept going. The Irish League stopped, but it kept going on a on a localized basis. And it depended then on on what happened. But hockey stopped and um it's, the hockey minute books are really interesting when they talk about the importance of doing their duty for king and country and for Three Rock Rovers Club alone 164 of their members fought in the Great War 64 of whom or 24 of whom who died cricket on the other hand stopped the Dublin horse show stopped uh, hunting kept going horse racing kept going on a smaller scale but still significant like there were still a lot of meetings took place and there's the brilliant old um, retired historian UCD Fergus Darcy he he talked about how the world of horses imagined that Sarajevo was just a fiction as if you know we continue our world will survive regardless of this and we will keep going and other sports cockfighting continued there are brilliant reports of illegal cockfighting taking place for example in Monaghan where there's 300 men at a cockfight and going on but perhaps the most interesting story when it comes to recruitment to the first world war is to do with the GEA and what happened with the GEA because in the years after independence, and we will talk about this, I think, a little bit next week, the GEA constructed a story around itself in which none of its members had fought in the Great War and in which it had staffed the 1916 Rising almost single-handedly. That's, if you look at year after year, Congress minutes, uh, official statements by the GEA and so on, that was the image that was created, and it's a nonsense. Yeah, I'm not shocked. To hear that, so <laughs> so England's misfortune being Ireland's opportunity. Did the GAA see it that way? We, you know, if, if rugby wants to stop, we will continue. Did GAA continue right through World War One? Yeah, the GAA continued all the way through World War One, um, and it was a really fascinating period in those years in Gaelic games. So Clare, nineteen fourteen, Clare won their All Ireland first All Ireland hurling championship, nineteen fifteen, Leash won their first All Ireland hurling championship, and then. In football, Wexford footballers won four in a row with an extraordinary team who were very lucky, very unlucky, not to win six All-Irelands in a row. They were an absolutely exceptional team. Mm. But around those teams, there were great stories. John Fox, the star of the All-Ireland hurling final for Clare in 1914, enlisted and fought in the British Army, joined up shortly after, after the final. And recruitment all across Ireland from GEA teams it was really, really interesting to watch. You look at Killaloo and County Clare, struggled to field the team. So many members have joined. St. Peter's in Belfast. Again, nine of their best players joined the team. And this is the extent of the, the, the enlistment from across Ulster by the British Ar- to the British Army. It was, it was being superbly documented by Donald McAnallen in, uh, in his publication about the sheer, the sheer scale of it. And yeah. such was the scale of it that Leash GA in 1915, the year they win the All-Ireland, they argue that this ban on, G, on British Army members being part of the GA has to be dropped for the duration of the war. This is just wrong yeah. that, that, this should, that this should be happening. We, we need these players. We can't, when they come home, they should be allowed to do this. And we should respect the fact that they are gone. But I think, I think the, so this is, these are numbers all, all around the place. And you get cork hurlers like Flory Buckley and Harry Burgess. Burgess won Victoria, Victoria Cross. And they died fighting in, in, um, in, in the war in Europe, in the army of, in the, in the British Army, in the uniform of the British Army. John Cunningham, the great Thurless hurler, died fighting Europe for the British Army. And the list goes on of, mm. of condolences expressed to the family of GEA players who died. And probably the most striking story of them all is James Rossiter. Now, James Rossiter was a brilliant forward who was instrumental in Wexford winning Leicester Championships in 1913 and 1914. Indeed, he scored the winning goal very late in the 1914 Leinster final. That year, he went on and played for Wexford against Kerry and Kerry beat Wexford in a very narrow All-Ireland final, but it was clear that Wexford were, were the coming team. Wexford come back in 1915. They blaze through Leinster. They get to the All-Ireland final. They win the All-Ireland final. But Rossiter is on the team. 
In fact, Rossiter is no longer alive. Alive ten days before that All Ireland final of of 1915, he died from injuries sustained while fighting for the British Army in France. Yeah. And his story was the cause of enormous outpouring of grief from people who knew him and played with him in 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 Wexford. And these are the tangles, the nuances of history, that decry the later attempts by propagandists, propagandists at the time as well, but propagandists later to construct a nationalist a nationalist fairy tale around the GA's involvement in World War I. And they went on to do the same thing about GA involvement in the Rising, which you may want to talk about. Yeah, we'll come to that now. I suppose it's very difficult to ascribe motivation to all of these GA players, though, who went off. Like, if you wanted to extend the fairy tale of nationalism for the GA, you could say that the likes of a Rossiter and all the other GA players who went did so to further the likelihood of home rule. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't know, we can't say why each individual GEA player might have went. This is, this is exactly the point, Joe, and it's exactly the point. And it's why it's also, so people go and fight in the British Army, people join the RIC, and it's really easy from 100 years on to look at them and paint them in a certain light and to, to imagine that um, they did it for a particular reason or that they were a particular type of person. And it's, it's, usually, uh, an, uh, it's usually what it is, is it's history suborned to the politics of a particular time and a particular cause and a particular crusade. The idea that you would feel capable of ascribing motivations always to a whole swathe of people and to understand them as a monolithic group is entirely wrong. Okay. And history, history demands uh, a complexity and a flexibility around these things. And that may not suit current politics. And it may not suit how people wish to see the past of their own association. And there will be GEA people who still find it very hard to accept that the GEA wasn't always to the pump when it comes to fighting for Ireland or for trying to free Ireland. But that's the reality. And the yeah. evidence does not permit of any other reality. So that brings us to 1916 then. How to the front of this was the GEA or, or, or Irish sport even, but yeah. primarily of the GEA? Yeah, it's really interesting. Again, the rhetoricians within the GEA would long have presented a picture whereby 1916 could not have happened without the GEA, how the GEA was to the forefront of almost all the men who fought in the GEA or fought in the, in the GPO or in, and, and in the Easter Rising um, were GEA people and that there were no, was nobody from any other sport and it just again doesn't hold water. Now, this is not to argue that there were not key members of the GEA who were central to the revolution. That's not to argue that at all. That would be a stupid argument to make. Equally, it is not true that um, the GEA were not involved at all. There were, there were, if you take it, that there were between 1,500 and 1,800 uh, rebels on Easter week, which is not an enormous amount uh, when you consider the, the size of the country. And the basic fact is that there were probably more GEA men in, there were more GEA men fighting in the Battle of the Somme in, in 1916 than there were in the GPO but even allowing for that about one fifth of the rebels who went out had um, a connection with the GEA either stronger or, or weaker it is also the fact that Sir Matthew Nathan um, the, the Chief Secretary and Central to Dublin Castle the organisation of British rule in Dublin Castle blamed the GEA as one of the main factors as to why there was a rising um, and the, they said the GEA was instrumental in it so those things, those two things taken together, plus the later, you remember the great pageant, commemor pageant commemorating um, the centenary of the 1916 Rising in Crow Park in 2016. It cr all creates this imagery of the GA being at one with the rebels of 1916. But there are inconvenient truths to that story which do not allow you to just repeat, re repeat it like that. For example, when they heard of Sir Matthew Nathan's statement implicating the GEA in the Rising, the GEA issued a statement immediately from a meeting of its Central Council in which they said that that statement is not just untrue but also unjust. It utterly rejected the notion that it was involved in, in, in the Rising. But it gets more than that. If you look at what happened in the rest of, of, of 1916, the GEA did two things. They sent a delegation to the House of Commons to meet the Revenue Commissioners 
uh, the, the English Revenue Commissioners, were to ask that they be excused from paying entertainment tax, this new tax that the British government was introducing on sporting and other cultural events in order to raise money for the war effort. And the GAA said, listen, we're a national pastimes organisation, we should be excused for that. So they entered into a dialogue with not just the Revenue Commissioners, but also General Sir John Maxwell. Now, General Sir John Maxwell was the man, the officer of the British Army, who was brought into Dublin to suppress the rising of 1916. It was Maxwell who oversaw and drove the execution of 15 rebels, uh, including Pierce and Connolly and so on, in the day and across 10 days after the rising. It was Maxwell who oversaw the, the internment of almost 3,000 people in the weeks and months after the rising, including many significant GA figures. And the GA met him. And they met him and they discussed this idea of getting off the tax. They looked for a meeting and they looked for, uh, for, for use of trains in order that they could play their matches. I make these points simply to show that the construction of a narrative of being at one, if you're so at one with the rebels of 1916, how can you meet their executioner afterwards? Mm. What about through the build-up to, say, the War of Independence, Collins' War... The retaliation in Crow Park, very famously, it seemed like whether they wanted to or not, they would have been dragged into it in a more overt way. Did they start releasing statements? Like, I've never even thought, for instance, what statement might the GA have released after the shooting of Hogan that day in Crow Park? I mean, did they, uh, did they become a bit more militant in their approach to this thing? Oh, yeah, the, the story is different. The story, the story of the War of Independence is an entirely different story than that. You get through 1917, and particularly in 1918 and 1919, the GEA was radicalized at central level. It was a radicalization which reflected the radicalization of wider Irish society. This okay. is something where the GEA reflects it, it didn't drive it. So you get the introduction now in 1919 of a rule which also banned from memory membership of the GA, any civil servant who took the oath of allegiance, which all civil servants did to the British Crown. This included people who had given a lifetime service to the GA. They'd spent 20, 30 years working yeah. for the association, building it up, volunteering. But now they were told to choose, choose between your job and your, and your involvement in the GA. Yeah. And that really put, it was a hugely divisive move. But the whole thing was swayed by Harry Boland, who was a central figure in the Irish Revolution and who, who stood up in Congress and was GM and stood up in Congress and said, that the GA has always owed its position to the fact that it has drawn a line between the garrison and the gale, and you must do so now. And all through this, the GA became more radicalised, in tune with Irish society. And I suppose the great, the the single um, most appalling event in terms of GA involvement was Bloody Sunday and what happened in November 1920, in a month that had seen increasing violence, and on the morning of of Bloody Sunday, 14 um, people were shot dead by Michael Collins' um, forces in Dublin. Um, most of them, though not all, were members of the British security forces. And that afternoon, in the most appalling scenes, a united force of soldiers from the British Army, um, soldiers from the Dublin Metropolitan Police, the Royal Irish Conservatory, and uh, Royal Irish Constabulary, and um, came together and approached three, Crow Park from um, three different places. They came down Jones's Road from along where Gill's Pub is. They came at it from the end behind where the Nally Terrace is, as in down Clonniff Road. And they came at it from uh, the corner behind what is now Hill 16. So mm -hmm. they came at this from three different angles. And the Dublin were playing Tipperary in a challenge match. And Dublin and Tipperary were the two best football teams in the country at this stage. And it is absolutely clear at this point that the GEA has been identified as being a nationalist organisation and this is the venue for revenge. And Croke Park is an entirely different ground now, or then than it was now. So, for example, the area, there was a terrace of houses where the current Hogan stand is and the ground was much more tightly packed in. But there were a couple of boys sitting in trees at the corner just over the canal bridge watching the game. And the first person to die in Croke Park on that day was a boy who was shot out of the tree by soldiers who were firing even as they crossed the bridge. From those initial shots, more shots came from the Hill 16, what 
Boston called Hill 16 at the time. We'll talk about that next week. But that, that will, people coming in from that angle, soldiers coming in from that angle, more coming in. And in this hail of bullets, ultimately 14 people die. And if you read, you have to, well, you have to think about this in two ways. There's the cover up, first of all, where the British Army and then the British Parliament and the British forces in Ireland and the very highest point of the British government issued a statement that the first shots came from inside the ground. And it's, it was just utterly lacking in any evidence. And, but that was the line that was taken. But this, is, this was traditional form. This is the form of the British government. It's the type of thing that was thrown out on Bloody Sunday in Derry in the early 1970s. It's thrown again and again in India for their cover-up for massacres there and so on. But as it has emerged with files that were appeared afterwards, testimony given by other officers, what happened at autopsies, it's quite clear that the shooting was indiscriminate. And the great wonder is that more people did not die on, on the day uh, than, than, than did actually die. Some were killed in the stampede to get away. Some were shot in the back as they ran for cover. And there was a bloodlust among some of the people who were firing guns into this place and a recklessness and a lawlessness, which was absolutely emblematic of the activities of the worst elements of the British Armed Forces in Ireland during these years. You know, you just got me thinking in a way I have never really thought before about that day because it's just billed as retaliation for the uh, shootings that Collins had ordered to be carried out the night before. And obviously they were targeted killings. I mean, violence is violence, so I'm sure people can find both abhorrent, but they were targeted killings and clearly what happened to Crow Park was indiscriminate be it in, again, Leaving Cert History or even the Michael Collins film, which a lot of people would have seen and, and it kind of brought home what happened that day to people. The cover-up is never really talked about. I mean, now that you think about it, that the army in charge of the country would indiscriminately shoot citizens is illegal, is an outrage, and even by the standards of those days would have had to have been covered up. So there was an inquiry, there was outrage, there were lies told in Westminster about what happened. Oh yeah, so we, ha we have to think about this. I actually think that like, later in the year when we, when we come to November, we should do, you should do a, a, a show on this. I mean, Michael Foley is brilliant on it. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are Anne Dolan, who's a Trinity College historian, is superb on what happened in, in the morning. Like the morning, let's talk about the morning for a second. What happened in the morning was not just a simple targeting of things. They shot also the wrong people as well as shooting people who were operative. So there was a couple of innocent people shot in this. And right. some of the manner in which they were shot carries a cruelty which within a war, you can dress this up any way you want, but it's cruel. It's a man hanging out a window being shot in front of his fiance and, and so on. And there's a really there's a really cruel element of this which destroyed the lives, not just of those who were shot, obviously, who lost their lives and their relatives who survived, some of whom witnessed it, but also the killers who did the killing, who were, in several instances, utterly traumatized for the rest of their lives and they had their own lives destroyed by the killings which they had undertaken in that morning. And Anne Dolan has documented this in a brilliant article which, which uh, is, is, is really, worth, uh, really worth reading. That's the first thing. But in the second thing, the cover-up, the series of cover-ups which were, which, are, which were put in place, first of all at a local level, by the army, and then by Dublin Castle, and then by London, and then the Cabinet Office, and how it continued for so long, the denial of responsibility, the blaming of the people from within inside the ground from it. It was an absolute travesty. What happened on the day was a disgrace. It will, and much worse than a disgrace. There are not words adequate to describe the scale of the indiscriminate nature of the shooting that was undertaken by the British Army when, when they came in here. But what happened afterwards is an incredible stain on the record of the British government that it should indulge in the cover-up that was undertaken afterwards. Okay. And did they ever issue an apology in the subsequent... Oh, no. I've, I've not found it if it's... I've not found it if it's, uh, if, if, if it's there. Okay. Uh, Round up this chat, the clock's against us, this, this incredible 20, 30 years. So we haven't even gone near World War II. We'll do that in, in a subsequent mm -hmm. um, lecture. So, so round up this period, because clearly sport, war, wow, it's a melting pot. It is. It is um, it's a melting pot. And the legacy of, of this decade are the divided politics of Ireland from 1920 to 1921. And what you had after this, 
is is a society which is sundered. It's sundered by partition, by a border which which now runs dividing six counties of the north from 26 counties of the south. And this has huge implications for the organization of sport, which had previously been conducted on an all-Ireland basis. And the capacity of sporting organizations to respond to that is something we'll, we can we can talk about next week. That's one that's one legacy. The second legacy is the fact that people still manage to find ways to play largely through this front. Like I, we didn't mention this, but one of the amazing stories from the front during the year from these people who went is the, that they continue to play football on the front. Some of the money raised by uh, by matches for British Army soldiers was used just to buy rugby balls to send out to players so they could play out there. And all across the Western Front, people played football. And this feels, this, is, this sounds scarcely believable, but there are, there are reports, well-documented reports, established reports, that going in over the top, in the Battle of Luce and in the Battle of the Somme, in at least two instances, there were a group of men kicking footballs as they attacked the, the, the British Army line. So this is the story of sport being replicated at the war. Number three, the sense of the GA's identification with nationalism was really, really bound in to the period of 1919 to 21. And later, as we will see, a whole story was constructed about, about, about 1916. And all around this, though, you have a sporting world which, again, reflects the society in which that sport is being played. And this is a reflection of war. Professor Paul Rouse, excellent stuff. We'll talk next week. Thank you, Paul. Thanks a million, Joe.